So the idea of today uh, is really about focusing on how to preserve and stabilize your phenolic potential. So if we consider we start with an initial potential from our grapes, that is 100%. Of course, this potential will vary with varieties. We are not talking about the same um, potential if we are uh, comparing a Pinot Noir and a Cabernet. Uh, it also um, will vary with maturity of the grapes and the health of the grapes if there is some botrytis condition or rot conditions, okay? From this initial potential of 100%, our goal is to end up uh, with um, almost also 100% um, of our potential in the phenolic structure and color of our final wine. To achieve this, we have to work on extraction, on protection, and on stabilization of our phenolics and color. Okay, so that's going to be um, where we are going to focus on today. How can we extract, protect, and stabilize um, in the best way our initial potential from the grapes and transfer this to our final wine? Then uh, a little bit of chemistry before we really go on the uh, process steps is which phenolic compounds are we talking about? Because maybe not everything uh, is going to be beneficial. We might not want to extract, protect, and stabilize every single phenolic compound. So when we are talking about red grapes, we are talking, or red wine, we are talking about um, several families of phenolic compounds. The first one is going to be the non-hydrolyzable. This can be separated in two families, the non-flavoloids that are um, hydroxycinamic acids that are present in the flesh. These are also uh, for white grapes, and they are going to be uh, small phenolic compounds that really can impact a little bit the mouthfeel, but mostly are um, the initiation of uh, oxidation reactions. Okay. Uh, then we have the flavonoids. These ones are present in the skin, in the seeds, and in the stems. So that's going to be the phenolic compounds we are going to want to focus on in terms of extraction. We are talking here, when in the flavonoids, we are talking about anthocyanins. Anthocyanins, as you can see, is a positive uh, molecule. It is the molecule responsible of the wine color. When um, in wine, it is free and unstable because it's highly positive, so it can react with many compounds. We want the anthocyanin to react with some tannins or polysaccharide to really stabilize it and have it uh, colored. Then we have the flavonols. Flavonols are uh, small um, tannins that uh, will act as copigment. Uh, so they are actually very essential in terms of helping stabilizing the color, but also uh, they participate to the mouthfeel and the structure of the wine. And there is some studies that show that um, high so some wine that a consumer will associate with high value uh, are actually uh, related to a high content in flavonols. And then we have tannin condensed tannins. Um, the seeds, uh, tannin the seeds that are the tannins that are present in the seeds uh, will be a shorter condensed tannins, so 2 to 16 subunits, and they are catechin and epicatechin units. Then uh, when we are talking about the skin, we are talking about longer uh, subunits, and they are epigallocatechin de derived. Okay, so they are all different units, and basically in the skin, they are uh, longer. Usually, the tannin of the skins are consider way more qualitative than the tannin of the seeds, mostly because of their um, mouthfeel impact. Uh, the seeds can be very bitter, and it's harder to get a seed that is uh, riper in terms of phenolic. There is another category of tannins we can find in uh, wine, in red wine, but also in white wine. It's going to be the hydrolyzable uh, family. The hydrolyzable family are actually the gallic and elagic tannins. So tannins that can come from wood, we um, can add these tannins as, um, for example, a sacrificial tannin uh, because they have high reactivity with proteins. They also are a good uh, oxygen radical scavenger and elagic tannins are from uh, oak. So 
these tannins participate to mouthfeel and color stabilization too. Okay, so we will talk about these different family of tannins, but really I just thought it would be essential to uh, understand that we are talking about different molecules here. So now uh, going uh, to our process and really how to optimize our um, phenolic potential extraction and protection and stabilization. Let's start with the extraction part. Uh, to extract a compounds from the skin and from a grapes, we will need at one point an opening. So everything starts as soon as the berry open, as soon as there is a crack into this skin, then we can start to consider that the extraction will happen, okay? Um, one thing that is important to understand once the extraction happens, there is different kinetics because the molecules um, are different. The first molecules that we are extracting are anthocyanins. They are water soluble and it's very easy to extract them in the water phase, so in juice. So that's gonna be the first thing coming out. And as I was telling you before, unfortunately, they are very unstable. So we need to uh, stabilize them early in the process. Tannins will extract better with uh, the presence of um, ethanol. And the first tannins we will extract will be the skin tannins, and then we will come to the seed tannins. But as you can see here, we are extracting way more tannins at the end of alcoholic fermentation than from uh, the pre-fermentation um, cold soak, for example. Then there is polysaccharide. That polysaccharide we will see play also a pretty important role uh, in terms of um, stabilization of our phenolic compounds and um, color. And this polysaccharide same will extract uh, way um, better with alcohol and with longer time in contact. So here we have a little challenge. Seeing the kinetics of extraction, we are actually understanding that we have to do something early in the process. Uh, there is two things we can do, or we try to extract more anthocyanin, so considering we are going to lose some, since they are going to react with something else than tannin at the beginning, uh, but we still end up with a good potential. The second approach uh, will be to extract tannins and polysaccharide sooner in the process, so basically we have less difference at the beginning of fermentation when we have our peak of our anthocyanins, we can have more tannins and more polysaccharide to stabilize this anthocyanin early in the process. So for this, there is a different way uh, to uh, extract compounds from the skin and change uh, the kinetic and the speed. Uh, one will be crushing. Uh, so crushing will help you uh, completely open uh, basically the berry and uh, increase your extraction as you have a different ratio uh, skin uh, juice, you um, will, uh, by crushing, increase the extraction of the skin, but also the extraction of the seed tannin, and you're going to promote oxidation. So yes, you extract more, but you also lose more anthocyanin. So it is, um, there is a plus and minus uh, on this. You can do cold soak. Uh, many people do cold soak. Cold soak is still, as we saw, will promote the extraction of anthocyanin. So this is gonna be a strategy to have more anthocyanin, but you will not have more tannins to stabilize it. Then we saw that some, uh, it is actually highly uh, variety dependent. So some varieties will benefit of cold soak in terms of color, but most of them will not. Um, the true benefits of cold soak will be really for mouthfeel and aroma development. You can do saignée. So saigné or you know, juice draining, uh, this is basically a concentration. You are removing some juice uh, from the environment. So you're increasing, your, uh, you're changing your ratio skin juice. You will have a better extraction because you have a, more, a stronger concentration. Uh, so you will have more anthocyanin, you will have more skin tannin, you will also have more seed tannin. You concentrate everything uh, and you lose volume. Uh, sulfur, sulfur is uh, also um, an option. Some people will use sulfur because it acts as a solvent. So it's gonna degrade some of the cell walls of the skin and help basically extracting more of the compounds uh, from the skin and the pulp. Um, 
So that's a good thing. Then uh, sulfur, as we know, first, it's not really the, ten, the trend on the market. Everybody's more uh, focusing on reducing uh, sulfur these days. But also sulfur will uh, bleach color, which we actually um, know now that it's not fully um, reversible. Uh, some of this color that is bleach will be lost forever. And uh, sulfur can also create a stress for the yeast that will then um, induce some of aromas production. So sulfur can be a strategy, but it's really not the most used now. Using extraction enzyme can be a very good strategy to basically lose down the cell walls of uh, the skin and helping you extract better the compounds. So the tannins and anthocyanins that are present in the skin. Here, when you use uh, qualitative extraction enzyme, you really focus on extraction uh, of tannin and anthocyanin from the skin. We'll talk more about this. You can use some thermo treatments or pressure treatments. Uh, there is different options here, thermo vinification, uh, flash detente, uh, the concept of extractis that Booker is um, uh, has developed. This uh, will help you with different temperature and pressure to extract more compounds from the skin. Uh, again, this um, works extremely well in extracting more anthocyanin. Uh, but what we know uh, from what we know is that we really need to work very hard on stabilizing this anthocyanin early in the process because we always have way more anthocyanin than tannins. Cap management, that's uh, pretty obvious. There is many variations. You can play with delestage, you can play with pump over, you can play with uh, punch down and like how many you do by day and how long you do them will impact and at what step of the process you do them will impact, impact your extraction. Um, of course, uh, going stronger at the beginning uh, is recommended to extract more of the skin tannins and then going lighter on the end of the fermentation uh, will be recommended to slow down on the extraction of the seed tannins. Fermentation temperature, uh, the hotter you get and the more extraction you have, but also you will create more polymeric pigment. So uh, this is a very good strategy when you want to focus on color. Of course, it's gonna impact your aromas and the uh, development of the yeast. And one of the last strategies that uh, is commonly used is extending maceration. This is a great idea when you do have um, ripe seeds. So when you know your seeds are uh, brown and uh, not, so not green and not bitter. Um, this can be a very bad idea if your seeds are not ready because you will get green, you will get astringent and bitter. So extending maceration can be a strategy depending on the variety and the vintage maturity. Okay, so let's focus a little bit more on the enzyme. Um, in terms of all these different strategies. Um, so this here, you can see a cut of um, a berry, okay? And basically what we know is when you have the flesh, so the flesh in uh, most of the varieties is uh, colorless, except if we are talking about varieties like um, uh, tinted varieties, like Alicant Boucher, for example. Uh, but in the majority, there is no color in the pulp. So these um, cell, these cells have very thin cell walls and mostly rich in linear pectin chain. So this is going to be very extract, uh, easy to extract, and that's what it's going to give you the juice, um, but not necessarily the anthocyanin, the tannins, because they are present in the vacuole of the cells that are closer to the skin. These cells, uh, where the anthocyanin and tannins are uh, staying, uh, have thick cell walls with complex pectin matrix with branch pectins and they are very rich in cellulose and hemicellulose. So it is a very complex um, network of pectins that will be hard uh, to destroy and so makes the extraction harder. That's why with more time, with alcohol, there is degradation of this pectin and everything gets extracted. So we will need some physical um, intervention or the use of enzymatic uh, action or activity to really lose down the cell walls and allow a better extraction of the inside of the cell. 
Then if we look at different types of enzyme, uh, here you can see um, pictures of a test that is called the coloration of SHIF, a test which basically col color the polysaccharides present in the cell walls. So the control show you a very good example of um, basically there is polysaccharides everywhere. And so that's how the cell is. They are all made by polysaccharides. Then when you use a um, basic enzyme, okay, like let's call it enzyme X, um, you usually will have a selective uh, hydrolysis of some of the cells. And unfortunately, um, basic enzyme will focus on the linear pectin chain. And as you can see, hydrolyzed most of the uh, cells that are from the pulp here, but didn't touch the cells that are close to the skin where you can actually even see the vacuoles. Yeah, with xanthocyanin and uh, tannins. So this is not an enzyme that you want to use for extraction because it basically didn't help you at all to um, lose down the cell walls of the cell containing tannins and anthocyanin. Then um, at La Motabier, we developed an enzyme called Enosim Crush Red that really is here to have um, various action and being able to degrade a little bit every type of cell walls to really help the extraction. And as you can see, there is a little bit of pink everywhere. So we left some polysaccharide everywhere, but we did hydrolyze uh, the cell walls of the uh, cells closer to the skin and the vacuoles are empty. So we managed to extract our anthocyanin and tannins. So this uh, type of enzyme will give us the possibility to have more tannins, more anthocyanin sooner in the process, but also uh, we will have some positive polysaccharides. So here's some result of the enosim crush red. You can see, so these are exactly the same enzyme I just showed you before. Um, we are looking at the color and the content of polyphenol post-fermentation in the wine. You can see that basically the enosim crush red has a stronger color intensity in the final wine, but mostly and most importantly, uh, a stronger red color, okay? And also we have a stronger, uh, a higher content and concentration in phenolic compounds. So we did help to extract these compounds sooner and so stabilized them because they stayed in the final wine. I was talking also about some uh, polysaccharides. So just want to show you how um, our Onosim Crush Red uh, is actually very good in terms of extraction of polysaccharide and a little bit of everything. Here we can focus on the polygalacturonase activity uh, and also uh, some uh, hemicellulosic um, activities. The endopolygalacturonase activity is the activity that will release the RG2, which are a type of polysaccharide uh, present, type of pectin, I would say, that is very beneficial for uh, mouthfeel, for stabilization of tannins, and also for uh, stabilization of color. So um, it's actually an important molecule that will not impact um, filtration. So you don't necessarily want to uh, cut them down, but you do want to extract them. So thanks to the Enosim Crush Red that you can see is in red here, we can have a good release of this RG2, which will explain a good color um, stabilization. And also we have a good um, activity, hemicellulotic um, activity that will help the maceration thing. And that's explained actually the picture of uh, the previous slide. Okay, so why do I, why am I talking about um, polysaccharide? Here, a little uh, bit of explanation. This is a pretty heavy slide, but it's actually very simple. Um, just to uh, give you an idea of, you can have some tannins here uh, that will uh, with time agglomerate together and create a tannin colloidal, okay? So create an agglomeration. If this agglomeration is not stabilized, this tannin is gonna be too heavy and precipitate. The role of the polysaccharide in particular, the RG2 part of the polysaccharide is actually, they can interact with the tannins as you can see here in this complex um, chemical molecules, there is a direct interaction. Uh, there is some hydrogen bonding that can happen between polysaccharide and polyphenol that will stabilize this uh, tannin colloidal. So you don't lose the, your tannin because they are stabilized by the polysaccharide. 
you maintain uh, your color, you maintain your structure, but also um, this um, like, uh, polysaccharide tannin reaction and the fact that it makes a run like this makes your polyphenol not able to react with your salivary protein, which actually make um, your tannin not as aggressive and not as astringent and drying. So thanks to this polysaccharide, you feel rounder, more volume, bigger wine uh, without any aggressivity. So there is um, more than um, stabilization here. Okay, so that's why I was talking about RG2. So now just uh, to finish on the anosine crush red, it is a liquid pectinase that we um, highly purify. So it is highly purified in cinnamyl esterase and anthocyanase. Why it is important? Because a cinnamyl esterase could be, it's not every enzyme are purified and an enzyme that is not purified in cinnamyl esterase will actually be able to um, hydrolyze some um, hydroxycinamic acids into uh, precursors of uh, volatile phenols. So they basically will give you some precursor uh, for bretanomyces to transform in volatile phenols. So you have more risk of bretanomyces of aromas with a cinnamyl esterase activity. Why anthocyanase activity is important because some enzyme can actually have an acti side activity which will cut your anthocyanase, your anthocyanin from its sugar, making it unstable. Okay, so we uh, focus on purification. And thanks to this, we really have um, a pretty good uh, result in terms of extraction of RG2. As you can see here, we have in average 60% plus of RG2, which will impact mouthfeel and stabilization of phenolic component color. We have more tannins extraction, we have better color, we have less Prague. Prague are the pectin uh, that the the pectin part that will impact filtration and clarification. So to reduce this is important to have a good settling. Uh, and then a side effect as well that is very interesting is that you will increase your yield in a free run. So using enzyme will help you to increase your yield. So economically speaking, uh, you actually uh, come back to it because you increase the volume of your high quality wine um, by using enzyme. In terms of application, we're talking about 10 to 30 milliliters per ton and an addition on grapes at processing. So why would you want to use an enzyme to improve color stability, to improve mouthfeel, to increase qualitative volume, but also to improve filtration and settling? Okay, so that was our first step regarding um, extraction of these positive compounds and selective extraction. Now, our uh, second part is going to be about protecting uh, these compounds that we just extracted, because these compounds can be lost by um, oxidation and also reaction with protein. So you might already know this um, reaction pretty well, but basically a phenol uh, on juice can be oxidized by polyphenol, the PPO, the polyphenol oxidase uh, enzyme and the lacase when there is botrytis. In presence of oxygen, they will oxidize this um, phenolic compounds into a quinone that then will consume, react with your glutathione, so consume your natural antioxidant uh, protection, react with phenolic compounds, which is responsible of browning, but also loss of color and loss of structure because you lose your phenolic compounds, and this quinone can also uh, oxidize some aromas. So that's one way to lose your phenolic compounds and potential is oxidation. The second way is reaction with protein. Our phenolic compounds, um, they react with protein. Phenolics, tannins, anthocyanin, they can react with protein, mostly uh, tannins, which they create an agglomerate of a, a tannin protein complex that will uh, then be too heavy and start to precipitate. So again, we lose them. That's actually a strategy we do want to promote in white wine to remove proteins. Uh, so we can uh, add some sacrificial tannins to remove proteins, but in red wine, we are really talking about adding sacrificial tannin to promote this reaction and protect your own tannins from your grapes from um, precipitating. Okay, so to explain you a little bit uh, better the concept, I want to take the example of our protein R. 
which is our uh, sacrificial tannins. It is a pure anthocyanidic tannin uh, that is a strong oxygen radical scavenger, so you will protect from oxidation, and it has a high affinity with proteins, so you will avoid a reaction of your own tannins with protein and precipitation. How it happens is, let's take this example, that you have your control with your own tannin that you just extracted, you work hard to extract it, and then we take the example where we add protanin R, so our content of tannin here is bigger because we just added protanin R. We have our proteins that are extracted as soon as you extract juice, so as soon as your berries open, protein get extracted, same amount in both cases. They are going to react from this complex precipitate, okay? So when you use artificial tannins, you uh, manage to really protect and keep the potential of your own tannins, while if you don't, you lose a good part of it because of oxidation and protein. So we call it sacrificial because this tannin will sacrifice itself uh, to react with oxygen and protein before your own tannin will. So this, um, how to use it is, uh, you will use it at harvest as soon as possible, as soon as your berry is gonna be open, uh, that's when you want to use it. At 120, 180 grams per ton, uh, it is a tannin that is instantaneously soluble, so you can actually uh, sprinkle it directly on grapes. You don't need to rehydrate it. So it's a very um, easy to use tannin. So why would you use it to remove protein, to inhibit lacase and PPO, so to avoid uh, oxidation reactions, to improve color stability, to improve clarification, and also to just preserve your grape potential. Some results. Uh, here for you. Uh, you can see this is a wine where we use protanin R on grapes, and we are looking at the color and the polyphenol index post malolactic. So the wines has been, everything has been done the same. The only difference was the addition of tannin, protanin R on grapes. You can see the result is pretty obvious. We have way more color and more phenolic compounds that are the phenolic compounds of our own grapes. Okay, with the dosage we gave you, it's really covering the protein. Uh, picture, picture is usually uh, speaking better. So you can see the control is here is actually way lighter in color and uh, even a little bit hazy because this wine was having some lacase issue, some botrytis, botrytis issue. Uh, when we put a hundred gram per ton of protein in R, we already have a way better result in terms of color and um, clarity of the wine. And so when we put 200 gram per ton, uh, our color is even stronger. Then something interesting was to look at the um, stabilization of the color. Here we are looking at the color stability after the second racking. So this is usually about nine months uh, after aging of the wine. Uh, and you can see that basically the lower the delta NTU is and the more stable your wine is, we consider a below 15, 20, 15, a stable color. So we are not stable in both case, but we were starting very unstable. So this means we will have a lot of color precipitation, a lot of loss of color. Um, and we might have to actually do a fining or uh, remove even more to make sure it's stable in the bottle, while the protanin R here is way closer to stability. So using a sacrificial tannin is not only um, an effect on the grapes, but you really see the result on the final wine, even with aging. The third point in our uh, presentation is to talk about stabilizing this color. So we extracted it, we protected it, but then as I was telling you, anthocyanins are very unstable and they can react with many compounds and uh, not necessarily the one we want. So they can react with many compounds that will make them lose. So we want to kind of force some reaction and make this anthocyanin react with tannins, but not only just tannins, just the right tannin, okay? So to stabilize color, there is different type of um, processes that happen. Uh, one is gonna be a stabilization by condensation. So this is gonna be reaction with tannins, direct or indirect. The first one is like, that I put here is actually an indirect reaction but it is the most stable in time and the stronger in terms of color. Uh, this is gonna give you a very nice uh, purple type of color and it is a reaction anthocyanin 
ethanol tannins. So to have this reaction happening, you need some oxygen and ethanol presence. We'll talk more about this. So this can happen early in fermentation and later during aging. Then you have some anthocyanin tannin a direct reaction. So the anthocyanin will react with the tannin and that um, usually give you an in-color complex. It happens during fermentation that then as soon as you finish fermentation, usually when you do your pressing or your racking, there is a presence of oxygen that will uh, color the molecule and make your molecule brighter. I don't know if any of you have ever, ever observed that when you do your uh, draining of your tank, actually the wine gets um, more vibrant and more colored as soon as you finish it. Uh, that's because of the presence of the oxygen. And so you, you shift the color of this complex. There is another complex that can happen, which is a tannin reacting with anthocyanin. And that's without oxygen. This is a slow reaction. This is more something that happens later during aging. And it usually happens uh, in the bottle, actually, when there is no oxygen. And this is not necessarily a reaction we want to have because it's actually going to give you a little bit more orangey uh, type of note. So that's the color of like a wine that you will age for 20 years in your cellar. When you will open it and you see the color uh, aging, uh, that's actually what happened without oxygen. And then the, next re the last reaction of condensation is an anthocyanin reacting with elagic tannins, so oak tannins. So this can happen when you add some um, oak chips or if you age your wine in barrel. Then uh, the second process or phenomenon is uh, copigmentation. Copigmentation are weaker bonds um, with anthocyanin and other compounds. They have interesting effect because they will give you a hyperchromic effect, which means that basically the molecule you will form will be more intense in color and also batochromic effect. So the molecule you will form will actually have a switch in terms of hue and give you a color that is more on the purple, intense red, purple side. So it is a very interesting um, type of reaction to really give you vibrant and intense color, which usually you see in a younger wine because at the beginning there is a lot of copigmentation. Copigmentation, so it can happen with, it happened with a copigment. So flavanols are uh, co considered as copigment. We talked about it at the beginning, beginning. They are phenolic compounds that we extract from uh, flesh and um, skin and seeds, and actually mostly skin. And here, an example of how it reacts with an anthocyanin, you will have actually uh, interaction as a sandwich. So you're missing the next molecule here, but basically you have two flavanols and an anthocyanin in the middle, and they are like bonds that are not very strong, but they oscillate like this, uh, which maintains anthocyanin um, stable and also protected. Then you can have yeast manoprotein. This is something that um, it's very easy to, to visualize when you age your wine on lees for a longer time, usually your color is more stable. So the lees that the yeast um, are producing, they are going to release manoprotein that will um, be able to copigment some of the anthocyanin that were here, uh, allowing a better uh, color stabilization. Polysaccharide can do this too, such as Arabic gum, um, which are a product you can use toward the end of the process to stabilize your color if your uh, color matter is not stable. So let's see some example of both, uh, but before I want to focus on the molecule we are looking for, which is the uh, anthocyanin, anthocyanin ethanol tannin bridge. So our molecule that give you the more intense color and the most stable color. For this, we need to understand uh, when is ethanol produced. So ethanol actually is produced at the beginning of the fermentation by yeast. It is um, just a, a biologic path of the yeast that then uh, towards the middle, from the middle to the end of fermentation, the yeast is going to consume it. So we have a window here at the beginning of the fermentation. Then ma malolactic bacteria usually consume it. So our ethanol is going to reduce. So we don't have much window here during malolactic to do anything in terms of color stabilization for this molecule. And post-malolactic, 
that's where we, if we age our wine in barrels, we will have a micro, natural microoxygenation through the wood that will produce some ethanols, but also you can do some microoxygenation in a tank or just a racking will allow you to introduce oxygen that produce will then uh, make you produce some ethanol. So our goal here is not to accumulate ethanol. Our goal is to have um, to act when the ethanol is produced. So we are sure we use it to make this uh, condensation of the anthocyanin ethanol bridge, tannin bridge. Okay. So for this, we have been um, working uh, in the research department to develop the best tannins we can for each uh, part. So we came out first with a tannin called soft tannin vinification. So soft tannin vinification is a tannin that has a high stabilization effect that we recommend to use early in the process. How did we develop it? Uh, we actually use um, a test that is a test of polymerization by ethanol. We have a solution of uh, tannin that is clear. We are putting an excess in ethanol, and then we are because of this, we are going to form these molecules of um, condensed tannins, which will create a haze. Okay, and then we measure the NTU. When uh, the haze is intense, this gives us the tannin efficiency, and the speed at which one uh, the haze is appearing, this gives us the reactivity of the tannin. So faster the um, uh, solution becomes turbid and the faster the tannin is acting with um, anthocyanin and ethanol. So this means we, what we want is to develop a tannin that is efficient, but also very reactive to act fast at the beginning of fermentation. And so we compare many tannins. Here we are looking at the time and the turbidity of this test. And as you can see, the green line is a soft tan vinification that will appear with a high turbidity very quickly. So it has been the winner. And that's the one we are pro proposing for uh, color stabilization early in the process. It is a blend of uh, catechin, actually it is catechins that are bonded to uh, plants polysaccharides, okay? That's uh, our tannin. So basically the catechin is gonna be very reactive and able to form this uh, bond with ethanol and anthocyanin. And the polysaccharide that is there is able to stabilize the molecule and also um, cover the mouthfeel as we saw previously how um, polysaccharide can do with the RG2. The application is early to mid fermentation. Uh, 150 to 200 grams per ton, but better early as that's where the ethanol is uh, mostly produced. So some results here that I want to show you. Um, so first on a thermovinified Grenache. So this is interesting to see because they are actually the most difficult uh, juice to stabilize because there is a lot of anthocyanin and little, very little tannin, especially on a Grenache um, variety. So you can see a picture of the result. It's pretty obvious. And the uh, control is way lighter than the wine where we added soft and V. In terms of loss of color, uh, uh, six months uh, post fermentation, uh, you can see that the control lost about 39% of its color, while the soft and V lost only 20% of its color. So we did work on stabilization of the color. And in terms of mouthfeel, because it's also important to talk mouthfeel, um, the soft and V is a red line here. And as you can see, we, we have a better color, but we have a better balance and more complex wine with a bigger intensity in terms of um, aromas and way softer and rounder. So we win in every point. Uh, this tannin is uh, here to stabilize color, but also it will fill your mid palette and give you roundness and volume in terms of um, mouthfeel. If we look at uh, Pinot and a cab, traditionally uh, vinified, here are results uh, three months post malolactic fermentation. In terms of IPT, so in terms of phenolic compounds, uh, as you can see, if we compare the two, Pinot, uh, the uh, soft and V has 7% more phenolic compounds than the control, three months post malo. The cab has 9% more uh, phenolic compounds than the control. So a, a pretty good increase, but all just uh, we protected it more. If we look at the color intensity, Pinot uh, show 16% uh, more color intensity and mostly it's red. 
and uh, the um, cab show 13% more color intensity. If we look at the color stability, so uh, this is looking at the delta NTU, and you can see that basically our color is way more stable when we use soft NV on Pino and on CAB compared to the controls that were not stable at all. Okay, so these are very interesting results that um, there is a way to play during fermentation to stabilize all these compounds that we extracted. So we extract more, but also we need to use um, additive, added tannins to help uh, creating this um, very stable molecule with anthocyanin ethanol uh, tannin uh, type of form. Okay, then I was telling you that polysaccharide can be very uh, interesting too and for uh, stabilization of tannin complex, but also for co-pigmentation. So I want to talk about, about polysaccharide too, um, which here we focus on yeast monoprotein, okay? So we know that polysaccharides are extracted with time and uh, more on the extending maceration. So using an enzyme will help you shift a little bit this curve, uh, but then during, um, there is a big part of the polysaccharide that are released from the yeast. So we do need to finish fermentation to get this extraction. And sometimes it's too late to stabilize our compounds. So using um, yeast monoprotein that has been developed for it can be a good option. Here, uh, just a study to show you how, what yeast monoprotein can do. We are looking at two different types of yeast monoprotein and a control. And we are looking at the gelatin index that will uh, give you a feel for astringency, a PVPP index that gives you a feel of color stability, and ethanol index that gives you a feel of sweetness, roundness, and volume. Um, as you can see here, both monoprotein are from the control are reducing uh, astringency, are improving uh, color stability, and are increasing sweetness and roundness, okay? So, but they don't do it at the same way. So this means not every monoprotein is uh, equal and they are not all um, good for this application. Today, we focus on the color stability and knowing this, we have been working on uh, this problematic and developed a product called Nature Soft. Nature Soft, when you use it during fermentation, you can also during, use it during aging, but Nature Soft is actually uh, yeast derivates that has been rich in monoprotein. When you use it, you um, allow your uh, wine to be more stable in terms of color matter. This is in a final wine. You can see we compare the control, as I was telling you, below basically 20, uh, we can consider it uh, stable. Below 10 is extremely stable. Uh, in this particular wine, Nature Soft allowed it uh, allowed to reach full stability. If we look at different um, phenolic compounds, you can see here, we are looking at actually a lot of different anthocyanin. And we can see that at the end of the um, fermentation, mostly uh, for most of the anthocyanin, we have more content when we use the nature soft, not because we added anthocyanin, but because we protected them, we stabilized them and we didn't lose them. And then if we look at mouthfeel, uh, we completely shift uh, the profile of the wine. Uh, increasing a lot the roundness, the sweetness, but reducing astringency and dryness. That's because of the volume uh, given by the manoprotein, but it's also because the complex we formed are allowing you to protect your tannin from reacting with your salivary proteins. And that's very important for mouthfeel. So during fermentation, we really have uh, two options here. We can use a um, product like soft tan vinification to really um, stabilize tannin structure and color. But if we are in a situation that we have uh, too much tannins or uh, we don't want to stabilize so much our tannins, but we do want to focus on only the color, we can work with Nature Soft that will do a great job on color and also just bringing you a lot of roundness without adding tannins, okay? So depending the variety, depending the condition and your wine style, um, you have options. Then if we are talking about post-fermentation, there is options here too. Uh, and we, so we did the same work that we did with uh, soft tannin vinification um, with another tannin looking at how much uh, we can 
uh, react with ethanol to produce this anthocyanin ethanol tannin molecule during aging. Okay, and um, so here are some results. We, co we are comparing here all the product I talked about, but basically we ended up with a tannin called Tan Excellence, which is a blend of grape and oak tannins that has been specially developed for aging or using with microox to stabilize color. So here you can see a, a trial where we added all this product during fermentation and we are looking at the um, color post-fermentation, post-malo, and the color three months after. So the, the yellow is post-malo and the brown, the green is three months after. As you can see the control, so all the products worked great in terms of increasing the color during post-fermentation. Okay, so we are comparing soft add vinification, uh, some chips addition, nature soft, and tan excellence. You can see, but it's written here. Um, then three months after, there is a loss of color. Uh, of course, it can it happens with aging, uh, but um, the loss of color is way lower when we use soft tan V, nature soft, and tan excellence. The chips here has been great to produce more color at the beginning, but it's not a long term stabilization because three months after we lost a lot of this color. So chips are not the one that we recommend to really have a long term um, stabilization. Elagic tannins are not the best um, phenolic compounds to stabilize color. Then soft V has been very efficient in maintaining this uh, high color intensity. Nature soft as well. Uh, and Tan excellence even more interesting because it actually allowed to create molecules that gives you a more intense color. Okay, so that was to show you the different tools uh, that um, you can have during the fermentation and aging to stabilize color and work on your potential. So to uh, conclude here, when we consider we have 100% of your potential on grapes, then you're going to start processing as soon as you um, depending how you are harvest or this team, that's where you start to have an opening of your berry. You start to have um, an extraction and a possible oxidation. So here is essential to use a protection like a sacrificial tannin, protanin R, 150 to 180 grams per ton, depending your variety and your health condition. At this moment, it's also uh, important to consider extraction. So improving the extraction early in the process of um, acres phase because anthocyanin are gonna be extracted there. You do want to extract polysaccharide and tannin as early as possible and don't wait the end of fermentation for this. A nosing crush red will give you great results in shifting this curve of extraction, having more color, more stable color, but also more mouthfeel. And the um, benefits of uh, this is also to increase your um, yield. Then uh, during fermentation, that's where you can stabilize. You can work with soft and vinification, but also nature soft, um, depending your grape variety and your strategy. Of course, all your uh, cap management will impact a lot uh, your extraction and your way to stabilize it, the color. Then you arrive to pressing. Usually at this step with oxygen, all the molecules you form before will even more be uh, more vibrant and um, express themselves uh, more colored, and you arrive to the step uh, post malolactic of the stabilization during aging, where tan excellence is uh, recommended at 10 grams per hectoliter to focus on a long term stability and really not lose the color you work so hard to get. Okay, so these were the critical points for color stability uh, that we talked about today. Of course, there is other things you can do during your process to. Um, to manage color, to manage extraction, and to improve a stabilization. Some of them that I didn't talk about today, I just want to let you on this idea is to use alternative to sulfur. We saw sulfur act as a solvent, but also bleach color. We realize that when we use an alternative to sulfur, and so no sulfur on grapes, uh, so such as B nature to protect from microbial development, we allow a better uh, color at the end. So we have a way better color when we don't use sulfur on grapes, but we still use an alternative. Um, the yeast you are using will impact the extraction 
and also uh, the stabilization of your phenolic compounds and give you different structure. So we have two yeast, Exynos XR and DS, that can give you very different type of uh, phenolic structure and profile um, of your wine. So the, the yeast that you choose can be very important. And then again, an alternative to sulfur, post malo if you can delay your sulfur add and use a product like Kilbred, for example, which is a pure ketosan to protect from microbial development. This, uh, we have trials and we have seen also great results on color where delaying uh, sulfur addition will allow you to have a better uh, color stabilization. Okay, so I want to say thank you very much for your attention. Um, I will see you next time.